I used uh, Mermaid to make some nice flow charts in here, and I, I just think it's a lot better now. So I'm going to go over what I changed. Um, I have a little bit about uh, the exercises I intend to include. I don't have the data for them yet, so they aren't actual exercises yet, but they're like blueprints for exercises, and so we can talk that over. <clears throat> All right. So this is that chapter, how can I get started with APIs? This will be, so there will be an intro chapter that's like talking about the prereqs and what the book will cover, uh, what, what an API is. And then there's this chapter um, that is just to get you up and, and running as fast as we can. The learning objectives now are to uh, fetch JSON formatted data from the web and parse nested lists with the tidyverse, and that's it. The point where everyone had to leave last week is basically where the uh, the book would or the chapter or this whatever this piece would end. Um, I had gone into some other uh, open API format things before, and I think that was kind of uh, just confusing. And so I want to stay focused on just grab some data and parse it. Um, I'm going to kind of just go until I have like real specific questions, but please everyone feel free to kind of jump in if you have comments, thoughts, questions, anything as we go. All right, and so this is that same, you know, um, more and more, it probably won't be APIs.guru anymore, but it'll be something where I'm uh, showing you how to find some APIs. And as the, we do that, it's gonna be an exercise in getting some data. And so, I'm not going to jump over there and do this again, but we have the APIs.guru website that we can look around. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, it's good if you know what you're looking for, but it's less good if you're just kind of trying to explore, as we saw a little bit of last week. Uh, but we can grab the data directly. And so again, I would open up the JSON and we'll go through that, but I don't. I want to skip past all of that. Um, and now this is where things... Um, start to change a little bit. So uh, like we did before, you can grab the entire JSON, the entire list of all the APIs that APIs.guru knows about at this uh, URL with um, JSON Lite uh, from JSON function. Um, uh, the result is a huge nested list. And just to see, you know, it's like it has 2,500 uh, elements within the list, um, each or, or just a few of those, you know, like each one is an API. So we can see it's oneforge.com, uh, onepassword.com events API, onepassword.local connect API. They're, you know, different, different sites and uh, different APIs within those sites. Uh, this function from per again, per pluck depth tells us that this goes as deep as 10 levels of nesting. So it's a really complicated data structure to kind of navigate. Um, and it's hard to just look at it. Like this is just printing the first two levels of this. Uh, so not going down into that versions uh, list, but you can just see um, the first two members and the first two levels that it's this complicated nested structure. And so we want to rectangle it. Um, Oh, that's right. Uh, so I, I do want to put in just a couple of here where, you know, we don't do much here, but we're, we uh, learn a little bit about grabbing some data and kind of exploring lists. And so the idea is um, to, I, I'll provide a, um, some URLs of JSON formatted data. Um, almost certainly I'm just going to host this data on my, on the website for the book. So I don't have to worry about some website changing and the list, you know, the exercise is not working anymore. Um, and ask questions like, uh, you know, how many items, how many top level items, how many elements are in this data? Uh, how deeply is the data nested? Um, and then some specific thing of, you know, in the 17th item in the list or the item with this name, what is the, whatever, the widget, what is the name of the widget? <laughs> um, some thing where you have to actually go through and part, uh, go through, navigate the list. These should be pretty straightforward. Um, it's gonna basically be, you know, do these things um, with some other data, but I just wanna give people a chance to catch catch up or to make sure they can do the JSON light step. That's all that is. 
Does that, does that sound reasonable? I see a little bit of nodding, so cool. All right. All right, and then we're gonna go into rectangling data. And actually that set of exercises will probably be, I don't know, we'll see where it goes. Um, so yeah, uh, we talked a little bit about rectangling before. Um, yeah, um, uh, uh, Gabby pointed out uh, with some exercises, think also about one advanced question just to entice um, the folks that are more advanced to know more about APIs or coding. Um, yeah, this one, it's 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 hard because it's going to be like the kind of the first encounter with exercises in the book. But I don't know if we have any deeper thing to go into yet at that point. It, later things for sure. But that one, um, it's just barely getting your feet wet. Uh, but that is something that I'll have to watch out for, for sure. Um, I could, do, yeah, there, I'll wait and see kind of when I have the actual, or when I make the actual data, what are some things that would be um, interesting? Oh, actually I could, um, I could probably point to to some like Tidy Tuesday things and say, you know, here are some examples of more advanced nesting or unnesting or something. I don't know. that That has potential. Or I was just thinking, even with what, even with what you're working with, right? now right like you're showing us this thing uh specific specifically with that group through apis so we're looking at yep. all the apis that are in their like list of apis right so yep. what i'm getting at is not necessarily do a more complex exercise with other data but just which could be but also like with that an advanced question that would be like if you wanted to do I don't know, something. If you wanted to summarize the data in a way, how would you do it? Or something like that. Something that is more advanced, not necessarily yeah. super essential for the chapter, if you will, but just for the people that are. Yeah. Otherwise, Actually, so people get bored. I think in this next one, there are definitely some questions I could ask that basically are leading into the next chapter. Um. Not, I don't know if I have them yet at that point because there isn't. Um, I don't know. Well, I'll that's I will take that under advisement. That is a good point, and I, I do want to make sure that it's not boring. That's the thing that I worry about a lot. This chapter actually is that it is kind of you know low level. Uh, it, it's I don't know, it's not fun, but it's and, and you're not quite doing anything useful, you're getting close to doing something useful. Um, yeah, okay, that's that's a good thing to note. So, okay, rectangling data. Um, the idea of rectangling data is, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, sorry, it's converting hierarchical data, so those nested lists into a data frame. Um, it's useful uh, because then you can use R4DS, the, the book. Uh, you can uh, use dplyr and the tidyverse uh, all of those things once you have rectangled data. There is a chapter on doing working with this stuff in chapter 23 of R for Data Science. Um, but I actually think that there are some techniques that aren't covered well in that. I talked a little bit about that last week. Uh, so we're going to use some different methods. And I, I just I want to point out again that there might be uh, some trial and error ne necessary. Um, in order to kind of figure out where to go, I, I try to reduce that trial and error a little bit through this, uh, the way I have the chapter laid out now. Um, and I hope we'll see that um, there is, there's this format that we're gonna learn about a little bit later that is meant to like tell us what should we expect in the data. Um, it's not always available. When that is available, uh, it makes this all so much better. Uh, because you don't have to guess. It tells you, oh, this is what it'll look like. Um, and so we'll we'll talk about that more uh, actually in probably what's now the next chapter. All right. Rectangling involves a lot of unnesting. Um, so if you have these nested lists, the idea is to 
either uh, spread them out wider. Uh, sorry, maybe spread them out longer. If the value is, if whatever is in that value in the list is itself a list of observations, that's a case where you would want to make it longer and um, makes new rows. Uh, is the value a list of variables? So it's like more information about this one observation. In that case, you'll want to unnest wider and separate it into columns. Um, there's a function tidyr unnest auto, which uses a heuristic to choose between uh, wider and longer. And uh, in case you don't know, and I, you know, I like want to put this in the thing that heuristic is a fancy word that people use in data science. That just means set of rules. Uh, and I, I like to define that whenever I get a chance because people like to throw it around to sound smart, but it, it just means it's a set of rules. So uh, Unnest Auto uses a set of rules. It just says, if it's this, do that. If it's this other thing, do this other thing. Um, and we're gonna learn what those rules are. All right, so this is not currently super well or super readable, but um, hopefully this will help. So this is on Unnest Auto. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, oops, I'm not going to zoom in because Porto isn't letting me. Uh, can I not open that image? I cannot, okay. Um, it's annoying. All right, anyway, so this is uh, a, a diagram that will be hopefully more readable uh, in the next iteration of the book. Um, this is how Unnest Auto works. So it looks at uh, how many elements uh, within your list have names. If none of them or only some of them have names, it will unnest longer and drop the indices. If all of them have names, uh, it checks if any of the names are reused. Are they shared between different elements? If they are, if any of the names are, are shared, it unnests wider. If uh, none of the names are shared, it will unnest longer. And it will keep those names as the uh, as a column, uh, uh, indices column, so that you can work with those. Um, this is all like it's very uh, messy. Like I have this separated into none and some up here because we're going to talk a little bit about how you can do that better. But um, for example, if any of the names are reused, it, it says, "Oh, these must go together." Well, the names could be reused because uh, you know it's like versions, and it's got version one and version, uh, you know, version one, version two, version three. And several different things have version one, two, and three, but that doesn't mean you should have a column for version one um, and a separate column for version two. And so that's something you got to kind of watch out for that it's going to guess wrong in that case. Uh, it can also, um, it, like, it will say, oh, there are some things that aren't named. For example, if you have a row that doesn't have data, it will say, oh, that row doesn't have names, and therefore we should. Un unnest everything longer. And it, we're going to see some examples of that. It makes a mess and you don't want to do that. So this is imperfect. Um, a question I have at this point for everybody is, would it be helpful to actually see this as code? Or does the, like, other than seeing it in action, but I'm saying seeing like how it makes its decisions, would that be something you want to see? Here, because we're going to see different versions of the code. I don't know. I just wanted, I had that code and then I cut it out because it was hard to read. Um, and so that's something to kind of think about and feel free to respond in the chat or out loud. <laughs> I, I really like this flow chart. Um, and maybe I, I don't think I would need to see the code, but maybe like an example object that would go through each path. Okay, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see at least most of the paths and in the exercises, we're gonna see whatever paths we don't see uh, in the course of going through some things. So, okay, cool. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, the ordering here may change a bit to, to kind of see those examples before we go into it. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about what does auto, unnest auto miss. 
The first thing is if your list, um, your list, if you have a list column that is just a named list, not a uh, list of named lists. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Gabby says that I could have a repo for the book with code you didn't include in the book and then put uh, a little bubble saying, if you want to see the code, then head to insert link. I will um, almost definitely have that and or a package for the book uh, that lets you uh, see things. And so, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think, okay, I think I will move some some work earlier where we just do some pure unness auto before we talk about the, the mistakes that it makes. I think that would make sense. Um, so I would see the, the mistakes, but before I like pull them out as uh, this. So, okay, I've got some reordering to do still. Cool. One, one question just about the, <laughs> yeah. what's a mistake and what isn't. Like, <laughs> I feel like depending on what you're after, like, even if there's repetitive names, you might want to know how many times does each name repeat or something. I don't know. Like there yeah. might be other cases where you have a question that would want you should have it long or it's easier if it's long. Yeah. So yeah, we will be, I mean, we're, go we're going to go through some actual unnesting and um, like, I think most of what we do here in the, the easy example, unnest auto totally just works, but I can sh like I will show you the broken path. Um, yeah, so yeah, seeing the examples will help. I think, yeah, okay. I think, so we, we'll see some of that. We probably won't see every case that you would like to see today, but uh, a lot of it will be in the book. All right. Um, so yeah, this case, um, and again, this would definitely help to see it. And so I will make sure to have that available. Um, but if you if you have a list that itself, like each row of the list has names, and then you unnest auto, it'll unnest longer, and it just drops those names. Um, again, that'd be super way easier to see with an example, and I will make sure I have those. Uh, so yeah, it loses the the names. You can check that with something like uh, is named. There's a function in Arlang is named df, and so you can take your data frame, look at the column that you care about. If it's named, then you can do a mutate step where you uh, create a column for those names before you unnest. Um, we will, well, I think it's in the next chapter now that we would see an example of that, but I'll make sure we have an example of that in the code. Um, another thing it can miss is um, if, and I mentioned this before, if one or more elements of a list column are empty, um, an empty item doesn't have any names. And so therefore it thinks that um, it's just some, uh, it thinks that it should unnest longer whenever things don't have names basically. And it's really common in JSON data, especially that you will have um, you know, some level of the data just is missing for one one value, one row, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have the fully defined object for that one piece of data. And if you unnest longer, everything else gets all screwed up. Again, this is probably, this will make a lot more sense with an example that we're gonna see in a minute. Um, that can happen. It could be either a null or just a list without uh, any values within it. So an empty list, uh, super common in JSON. And so a check you can do is just, are any of the lengths, zero um and yes okay i thought i was missing a parentheses but that is correct and the fix is just uh only use the ones that have a length in your uh equivalent of unnest auto so you if you did all the unnest auto checks but you just get rid of all your any rows that are empty uh that that would make this so much better um, in fact, it's it makes this enough better that I think I'll probably um, create an issue on TidyR and suggest this because I think it, it makes so much more sense. Um, right. So it does, it will, um, 
it will take the suggestion of, hey, you should make this uh, longer. And I think there is one final check of, are the types compat the data types compatible? And actually, now that I say that, it will just error at that point if the data types aren't compatible. So it doesn't use the data types in its decision to go, oh, even though those happen to have the same name, clearly they don't go together. Um, so it does, but it does, it tries to uh, reduce them down to the common type. Um, that is, that comes in a lot with, uh, especially the kind of data we'll be working with because, you know, like versions, there can be some versions that are numbers and some versions that are the name of the version just depends on what that particular API chooses to name its versions. Uh, and so thankfully it does a pretty good job of saying, oh, okay, that those have to be character, even though at first it looked like maybe they were integers. All right, and then the last one um, is this mix of named and unnamed. If any of, like if it, otherwise it looks like it's gonna be a nest longer, um, but some of the objects have names, some don't, it drops the names. And so that means that data that you had is now gone. And so this is a case um, where all you have to do is check, like like I said, in the flowchart I showed this, uh, oops, that uh, how many elements have names? Is it none, some, or all? It actually, like in the code, it does, it does this check. It, it differentiates between none of the things are named, all of the things are named, and then some are named and some are not named. But when some are named and some are not named, it still drops the indices. Um, and we'll see in a second that there's a pretty easy fix for that. All right. And so, yeah, the fix would be that we keep those names and give them a descriptive name and then just have NAs in the ones that are missing names. So um, my updated version of the flowchart for how Unnest Auto, I think, should work. Uh, First, it's got this, you know, step zero is is the overall column named, like is the list named? If yes, then create a, a names column. Then go into your normal unnest check. Uh, how many non-empty elements have names if none of them do? Okay, that's the easy uh, unnest longer and drop the indices. If some of them do, unnest longer and keep the indices. Um, and if all of them do, that's where you would need to check, are the names reused? Uh, if not, unless longer, keep the indices. If the names are, are reused, that's, again, I'm still making kind of the mistake that it makes of, I say, yeah, unless wider, and sometimes you'll be wrong. And that is something where any automatic thing you do, you're gonna have to kind of watch it and uh, correct it. Again, in all these cases, I will have, um, I'm gonna like engineer some data and have it available for you to grab that has all of these mistakes <laughs> basically. And so you can see it in action. Um, all right, so now we're gonna go through some examples. Some of these will be woven in when I fix things, but uh, all right. So we're gonna go with the, uh, like we did last week, the APIs.guru list. In the, in the real chapter, I'm gonna use like smaller uh, fake examples here so that it's easier to see. And then we'll go through the real thing. So, okay, now that we know all these pieces. Um, there's the quickest side about in frame. I'm not going to dig into this again, but just uh, in frame is nice <laughs> for taking this data. In frame actually helps deal with the named list issue because it will grab those names off the back. So you can take care of that. All right. Well, um, and then, yeah. Oh, I created the flowchart and then didn't update these slides. But um, so now we, it's, we have this and we have this value, it's name list of three. Uh, uh, each of them appears to be length three. And before I showed you some steps on how to do this, but making the flowchart made these steps that I'm doing a little bit more um, systematic now. So first I check, uh, are those values, or is that column? So oops, is this column, uh, named um, overall, like does each one of these values have a name and uh, it does not. So we don't have to do that zero step. Um, 
then we we grab the non-empty ones instead of just grabbing uh, all of them and grab the names of those. And this would be really helpful to have like a flow chart over here with highlighting different things or something. And so I'm going to try to figure out how to fit that in. Um, and we check which of those things, which of those um, names are empty. So which of the element names are null and it doesn't have any. So it, um, it doesn't, it's not a mix. It's just that none of them are named. Um, or sorry, none of them are unnamed. All of them are named, which is a little bit confusing way to look at it. Uh, and so then we're going to look at, okay, do they have common names? And that's what this code here is. And this, I'm sorry, I'm running through this and realizing I shouldn't. So uh, <laughs> back up. Sorry about that. All right. We are, because um, this is not the code that I used last week. This is a much uh, more systematic approach. So we're taking uh, that column of values that we wanted to look at. Um, all the non-empty non values of that. And we are grabbing the names out of those. So the set of names. So this will be a list of, uh, you know, 2,529 items from this value column. And it'll be the names of this is the first uh, element in that new list, and then the names of this one, and then the names of this one, et cetera, through the entire set of data. And then we checked, are any of those names missing? So are any of those values unnamed? Uh, and it turns out that none of them are unnamed. All of them have names. Um, I need to look at my logic through here and see if it would make sense to uh, like, reverse this because it's got the double negative going. Um, that can be kind of confusing if there, there were reasons for this uh, in the original code. Uh, this is extracted from a nest auto basically, but they all have names. So then we want to look at, at those, um, those rows and see how many names do they have in common. And so this is where we're using reduce from per. This is a function that um, is, uh, it, like when you learn about it, it feels like it should be more use, or useful in more cases than it turns out to be. But this is one where it's actually useful. And what it will do is take uh, this list and uh, it takes like the first element in, in the list and compares it to or, and runs this function with the first element and the second element, finds the intersect. So it finds what, what names does, do the first and second element have in common? That and then it takes that list uh, or that that vector of the things that um, they have in common, compares that to the second one. So it's okay of the ones that one and two had in common, what do they have in common with number three? And they'll take that list or that combination, say okay of the ones that one, two, and three had in common, what do they have in common with number four? And so it's going through the entire list doing that, and therefore at the end you get just the ones that everything had. Is there, what names did everything have? And it turns out, oh, hey, it's got this added preferred and versions, which are the names that all of them have in this case. Um, it's three names. It's as we, as we saw, everything seemed to have three values. Oh, and, um, oh, and yes. So now, uh, yeah. <laughs> and yes, it is exciting when uh, reduce actually works. Uh, and is so is very cool. Um, sorry. So yeah, I don't have the flowchart line here, but since they do have names in common, that takes us down to that bottom right corner of the flowchart of, okay, we should unnest wider. And so let's go ahead and do that. Um, that's where we can take this DF and unnest that column wider. And we get those columns added preferred inversions, which are the names that they had in common. Uh, so it's exciting to see that happen. Um, um, I'll have to think through your comment there, Kevin, but yeah, reduce, uh, I don't know. It's a fun function to learn. And like I say, it, it's like, it's one of those where you're like, oh yeah, that is cool. I can see where that would be useful. And then 
you know, four years later, you're like, what the heck was the name of that function? Because I think I finally found my case. Um, but it's a good one to learn for sure. And this is a case where it works really well. All right. Um, and so this is where I backed up and we're saying, okay, what if we went wider? Or what if we went longer instead of wider? Our flowchart said to use wider. What happens if we go longer? And that's where we get this uh, value column. It does, you know, by default on this longer, keeps the uh, keeps a name for the column, uh, keeps the names, and it just makes a row for edit, a row for preferred, a row for versions, and then row for edit, row for preferred, row for versions. This, like, when you go longer and you should have gone wider, this is a characteristic error where you've got, like, um, a pattern, a repeating pattern of the type of data. It's character, character, named list, character, character, named list, character, character, named list. That's showing you, oh, that should have been column, 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 and then, you know, column one, column two, column three, column one, column two, column three. So that's something to kind of watch out for when you have something repeating like that. Uh, it probably should have gone wider instead of longer. That's where, um, and we will have already seen this <laughs> once I have my fake data to insert. Um, okay. Uh, oh, so I do have this function. And again, this is one that I'm going to link to, but I wanted to just keep it in here. This is where I took uh, Unnest Auto and then made it easier to read and made it do the things that we want to do. Um, I actually thought I had commented this out because I don't think I want to include this code here, but the code is available. If you want to go through, I, I just, I have some code that is going to do all the stuff that we just talked about because then we can, um, uh, come up here. Did I do this? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we went, ran through, I'm, I'm speeding up a little bit cause I want to talk about some other things. Um, and this is the same, doing the same idea for the next column. Um, it shows that there are no common names. And if we just use my function that is basically doing all this, it will return, oh, hey, you should unnest longer, but you should keep the indices because there are names that you want to keep. And so it tells you what to do there. Um, again, we'll go through that code separately. Uh, I think that is one that I'm just going to include in the package. Um, in the book package because the code to implement it involves tidy evaluation and some other confusing things so that I don't want to go into in the book. Um, but yeah, if we do that, we do what it says, uh, give it a better name than descriptive name. So we're going to say that that new column is the version column um, or version number or whatever we wanted to call that. And we can see that now, um, don't, uh, almost all of them only had one version. And so it is just, it's um, it's creating our new uh, 3,992 row uh, table instead of 2,592 or whatever it was. Um, again, I know I rushed through that, but we, we went through it last week and the code is there if you want to see it. And in this case, if we wanted to go wider, um, I threw in this head here because if we, a lot of times, if you should have gone longer and you instead go wider, you get an insanely large table uh, because this would have had around 800 new columns if we had gone wider from the original data. So it'd still be like 2,529 rows, but 800 columns. You don't want that. Uh, so that's a, a sign, like the instant sign that you went wider when you should have gone longer is you have like hundreds or thousands of columns. Um, that's, you know, that, that isn't what you wanted to do. So in this case, um, I, there has to be more than one, uh, uh, API that has version 1.0.0. Like, and so the, the, um, heuristic would say, oh, there are names in common. It must want to go wider. But of course you don't want to go wider just because some of them happen to share a name. Um, that would, you know, you don't want 800 columns. Uh, so this is uh, this is the case of what you don't, you know, you don't want to do. And again, an easy way to see it is you can see that each one has like one entry, but 
point or 0.0.1 uh, only has an entry for this first row and there's nothing for, uh, sorry, nothing for the other rows. And then 1.0.0 only has an entry for the second row and there's nothing for the other rows. Um, so if you have lots of nulls in your data when you unnest, that's a sign that, yeah, you probably should have gone longer instead of wider. Is that making sense? All right. And then, oh, and then I'm going to get just go ahead and do some filtering. The end here kind of peters out because we're setting things up for the next section. Uh, we talked about this again last week that we're just getting the data ready. Uh, and, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, so the thing I did do here is um, I just got rid of the extra version. So we're only looking at the versions we care about. And um, I'm gonna just use my function here real quick and it'll tell us that, oh, we should do, uh, do the mutate step to keep some names that it would otherwise list or lose and then unnest wider. Um, if we do that, um, Yes, I don't, that code shouldn't, oh, sorry. Yeah, this, so it turns out that this mutate that it tells us to do, we don't want to do in this case, so we can ignore that. Um, I need more notes here to make this make more sense. I apologize. So we don't, we've already dealt with those names. We don't need to keep them, but we, okay. So we want to unnest wider. And when we do that, um, Oh yeah, okay. In this case, that's fine. So we we get you know these columns. Everything's looking good. We get new new columns, new pretty things. But we do still have one. This info column is still a named list, and so um, I had yeah we had talked about what the columns mean last week. I don't care about that right now. But we have this one this info column. It is a list. It's a list column. It has names. And if we go through the code again, it will tell us that we should unnest wider. And that's not wrong, but when we actually do it, see, we went from 10 columns to 76 columns. It's not like insane. It didn't add a thousand columns or 800 columns or whatever, but it does turn out that in this case, there's just, there are all kinds of different pieces of information within that data. Um, we are getting a fair number of nulls again, because in this case, not everything has that information, but it makes a column every time. And we don't at the moment care about all those columns. And so here I just wanted to point out that we have another option, hoist. So instead of unnesting, if there's just one piece of data that you want in the nest, you can just hoist a single column. So hoist is um, basically what unnest does. It just hoists everything. Hoist means reach into that nest, nest or reach into that list and pull something out. A nest says, oh, I'm going to reach into that list. I'm going to pull all of them out. So it hoists every column. If you use just this function hoist, you're going to grab uh, just the one you care about. And so we've got that um, thing that had the 10 columns. And we can say hoist. I want to hoist out of the info column uh, this X APIs guru categories. And I'm going to call it categories. And when I do that, I just get one new column. So instead of 66 new columns, I got one new column, uh, and that is this categories. Now, in this case, uh, it is a long list of one, it seems like, because of a few of them have more than one category. Um, I should probably try to edit this so it, you can see that, um, because right now it looks like the, it kept it as a list for no reason. Uh, yeah, so hoist, I like I had used it last week, but I used it so quick that it was unnoticeable. And I realized, no, I want to actually like teach that. That is a tool you will need when you're working with uh, API data because you'll often have columns that you don't care about. It's sending you back information that's from your perspective extra. And so you can use hoist to just pull out the piece you want. All right, and so... Well, yeah, you had seen it. It just wasn't uh, made clear. And hey, that's not your fault. It's my fault if it wasn't clear. So, all right, you can um, take that uh, data that we had. Uh, we can hoist that thing. And then um, I do the step of filtering. And I'm sorry, this is the one where I'm like, this is just setting up for next week of um, the point here being that we can um, 
work with this data as data. We can do things, tidyverse things, and we can filter, we can um, uh, just, you know, uh, select different rows, we can or filter for different rows, select different columns. Um, we could on us longer and uh, on that categories column, instead of doing this row wise thing that I'm doing, we could do it, you know, another step and make new rows. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else we wanted to get to here because yeah, th all the rest of this, we don't care about yet, um, but this is getting us set up. We've got data that we're gonna use in the next chapter to actually get data out of uh, out of these this table. And yes, we can do tidyverse things now. And that is the very fun thing to do. All right, so exercises, again, I don't have the actual exercises because I need to construct some data sets and post them. But the idea will be, that I'll provide a bunch of uh, constructed data uh, and then have you choose directions. So I'm gonna make sure that I include uh, a data set that is like pretty simply and um, cleanly should go longer, a data set that should go wider, um, The where the overall column is named, which we didn't see any example of where that screws up, but um, I'll have that. Uh, I'm going to have some empty values uh, which again, we didn't see in this exact data, but I will have that in the sample data that when we play with it. Um, and uh, I also will have um, some cases where unless wider choose or unless auto chooses to go wider and shouldn't uh, just so that you can see um, how that works. And I said some cases, probably one case for each of these things. Um, oh, and then, um, some cases where there happen to not be names on some things, but it definitely should go longer. Uh, the, an example of that being, it, it was very possible that some of these versions wouldn't have a name. Like if, if the data just happened to be lacking a name for one version, and that shouldn't change your decision on the fact that you should go longer. You'll just have NA for one name. And I mean, I think, you know, you guys have all worked with data. You know that data doesn't always behave the way you feel like it should. Uh, just, just because everything should have a name doesn't mean that everyone's going to give everything a name. Um, and so that is the case. And that that is the new chapter. So, or the new version of that chapter. Uh, Kevin, especially because you made it through all the way to the end last week, we'll notice a whole bunch of other stuff that I had here is now gone. And it's because I wanted to focus this in on this chapter is all about rectangling the data. And so what I pulled out into a brand new chapter is we'll talk next week about uh, the Tiplify package and at the same time do a pretty deep dive into um, the open API uh, standard or open API specification for APIs because the Tiplify package has, especially in the dev version, has some functions to work with that standard to do all of this stuff for us automatically. Um, but you want to make sure that you know how to do it because not everything has the standards. Even when they use the standards, they, they sometimes are wrong. They give you data that or information that's not true. Um, and so you want to be able to do this yourself. So yeah, next week we will dig into uh, some actual returns from APIs. Uh, any, any other comments, questions, et cetera, on this. I apparently have a bunch of stuff coming in, so. Um. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, these notes are on the site, rfds.io slash whopper. Um, so if you want to pull up that function that I wrote about uh, choosing the direction, the code for that is there. Um, and everything else that I kind of blew through today. Uh, and uh, that that should do it. And like I said, I now I say, right now I intend to have a brand new chapter for us to talk about next week. Um, well, half brand new. Uh, I have some chaos that I'm dealing with. And so I will let you know if that stops me from having time to write. Um, yeah. And, and speaking of that, I um, need to run. <laughs> so I will talk to you all uh, on Slack. All right. Thank you.